thank you, first of all, very much for having me in, in this lecture series. I'm a big fan. I think it's a great initiative and, uh, and something good that comes out of a pandemic. So as Brian said, I'm going to be talking about uh, pair distribution function analysis and how we are using that to study the structure of nanomaterials. So I'm a, a chemist and a material chemist. And if we now, wherever we are, sit around in the world and, and look around us, well, pretty much everything that, that, that we live with and the stuff that defines our world comes from materials chemistry. So it's the chemists uh, over the last hundred years that have developed the materials that we live with now and energy uh, technology in our computers and in pretty much everything that we surround ourselves with. Now, as a chemist then, well, we can think about how we have gotten to this point. So first of all, a chemist will go to the lab and, and try to synthesize some material. Um, this might go wrong or it might go, uh, go right. And the next step is then usually that we would also need to characterize uh, the material and specifically the atomic structure of it. And for the last hundred years, this has been defined by crystallography. Because of crystallography and because of X-ray and neutron scattering, we've been able to develop all these materials that we have around us. Because by, it, uh, by understanding the atomic structure, well, then we can test properties and then together have some kind of understanding of the structure property relationship. And this is what has, uh, has led to everything that we have today. But if we then look at what materials chemistry is right now, oops, well, then a lot of this has turned into looking at nanomaterials. So as we become better chemists over the last 20, 30 years, we're now able to stabilize and synthesize materials of very small dimensions um, in a reproducible way. So we can make nanoparticles um, and even engineer materials on that scale. And this is something that's affected a, a lot of different areas in materials and catalysis, batteries and photocatalysis. And, and basically where we look, we're considering what nanomaterials might, might do for us. Um, but that also challenges a little bit the way that we, that we do this work. So we want to engineer structures at the nanoscale, but to really sort of think about this materials development, well, we then also need to determine at their atomic structure. And this, this is, a, is a challenge. Because usually if I go to the lab and I make something that is a bulk material or bulk powder, I get a diffraction pattern like this and I can use crystallography to analyze it. But the issue with nanomaterials is that we'll get scattering patterns like this. Um, and this, at this point, we're not, uh, this, we are less routine uh, sort of practices in how, how we can then um, analyze the atomic structure of this kind of material. And of course, this is something that, uh, that can be a problem in this material discovery timeline. Because if we cannot characterize the atomic structure, well, then we can characterize the, the properties and we can understand how we made it. But having this understanding and therefore optimize how we might make a new material, well, what that will like. So um, this is what has been coined uh, for a few years now, the, the nanostructure problem, that we can make nanomaterials, but we cannot really uh, characterize them. Um, and for that reason, a lot of nanomaterials are really just considered as um, bulk cutouts or cutouts, sorry, of the bulk crystal structure. So if we make a nanoparticle of a specific material, well, we sometimes just assume that the, that the structure of the material, it would be the same as, as for the corresponding bulk material. And, and we're showing more and more that this is not really the case. And the way that we can, we can look at this is then, of course, with total scattering, because we might not have nice and sharp bright peaks, but we still have scattering data. And if we collect total scattering um, data sets, well, then we can still analyze the atomic structure of this. And then, then the way we like to do this is with PDF, so pair distribution of function analysis, where we Fourier transform um, the data into a PDF, so a function in real space. There's no magic in this. This is just math. Um, but it means that we can, we can now, uh, in real space, analyze the crystal or so the atomic structure because the PDF will now, we can see that as a histogram of all interatomic distances in the structure. So that means we have a, a bit more of an intuitive view of the structure than we have in Q space. Um, it's important now that this is not at all new. So Peter Debye derived the Debye formula back in 1915. And uh, in 1927, we saw the first sort of Fourier relationship to, uh, between a scattering pattern and the PDF. And the first real PDFs were, were collected around 1930. 
Um, so it's not a new technique, but it took a while or has taken a while before, um, let's say, a broader scientific community has used it because at this point it's, it wasn't maybe worth as much and it was a, a lot of sort of um, struggle to get a PDF and maybe it didn't contain that all that much information because you had uh, low computer power and, uh, and the, the facilities, so the scattering, uh, the nutrients and the x-rays that, that were needed, well, they weren't really available. But we have that now. Uh, we have synchrotrons and we have neutron spallation source that can give high energy um, radiation and we have fast computers and that means for the PDFs that we can have high resolution in R, we can have high sensitivity and, and we can collect lots and lots of data and we're also uh, getting much better at, at modeling also because of computer power. So that means that PDF really is becoming a routine technique for a lot of scientists and uh, chemists and, uh, and physicists, geologists and pretty much wherever you look. Um, so the question, of course, is can, can this help in solving the nanostructure problem? And, and I, uh, I hope I can show you that, uh, that yes, we can. So um, one of the examples I want to show you today is on molybdenum oxides. This is one of our favorite materials because it has an extremely rich structural chemistry uh, in the bulk phase and also in the nanophases, we'll see. So the idea here is that you can stabilize a lot of different molybdenum oxides. Uh, this is MO2, which is the distorted rutile phase. And then you can synthesize also MO3, so the oxidized version. And in between, you can form what's called Magnelli phases, which are these um, uh, defined stoichiometric phases, but where you have uh, crystallographic shear planes. We'll get a little bit back to that. So the idea here was that, well, we know that they have a rich structural chemistry in the bulk phases, what about in the nanophase? Because when you look in the literature um, of molybdenum oxide, which there is a lot of, because um, they have applications in, in, in a lot of different fields, in particular in batteries right now, um, it's very clear that something happens to the structure uh, and also the properties when, uh, when nanosizing. These are just examples from literature of molybdenum, or scattering pattern, powder diffraction pattern from uh, molybdenum oxide nanoparticles. And there's definitely something going on with some very, very broad um, features in the patterns like this. Um, and it seems to be very size dependent. And for a PDF person, when we see scattering patterns with these very broad features, this is uh, our favorite kind of materials because uh, then PDF can, can really help us. So uh, we went to the lab ourselves where my former student Torst did and synthesized molybdenum oxides of different sizes or different crystallinities. Um, by changing the, the solvent. So we, we, we did a synthesis in, in a very simple thermal way where we varied the olelamine and the ethanol ratio um, then to get uh, different um, sizes of the crystallites or the particles that came out. So 0% here means that it's 100% ethanol uh, as a solvent. And then as we increase the um, percentage of the amine, in the synthesis uh, or as a solvent, well, we get smaller and smaller particles and we get almost to something that, that appears completely amorphous. And this is the kind of structures that we were inter interested in analyzing because this seems to be something that, that forms generally for small molybdenum oxides. So the first thing that we do when we get to this kind of step in a synthesis is that well, we collect powder diffraction data and then we do a refilled refinement. So for these crystalline materials, so this was synthesized with a high degree of ethanol and solvent, well, we can, we can do a, a normal Reedwell refinement and, and analyze the structure like this. But when we then try to, to make a Reedwell refinement of the data from these nanostructured, as we call them, molybdenum oxides, well, then it goes pretty wrong uh, and we cannot really describe the data at all. So instead, we turn to PDF. So we took these samples to um, the APS and, uh, and collected total scattering data from them. And then we Fourier transform to get to the PDF. Uh, and the idea now is that we can do the same as we did in QSpace, so for the powder diffraction data, but then um, do a real space free field refinement um, because that can help us in understanding what might go wrong. This is a commercial molybdenum oxide sample and so you can get a fairly good uh, description of the PDF here. These are the crystalline nanoparticles, so synthesized in ethanol. And these are then these nanostructured nanoparticles that we synthesized with the amine solvent. And if we look at the crystalline, or sorry, the commercial and bulk molybdenum oxide, well, we get a fairly nice fit. There are some issues uh, which we think arise because of uh, um, preferred orientation. But basically, we, um, we, we, can, we can have a, a different curve that looks similar across the R range. 
If we look at the 40 nanometers of the crystalline nanoparticles, we can see that we fit the long range order fairly well. Um, but there's actually issues that we weren't expecting, but in the local range, and we'll get back to this. Then for the nanostructured molybdenum oxides that are about four nanometers, well, we have a very bad fit, which we expected because we also couldn't uh, fit these in Q space or in a retail refinement. So basically, um, this confirmed what we saw before, but because we're now in PDF space, we can go in and in real space, we can go in and see what exactly goes wrong in the synthesis or is already in the modeling. So these are the, um, the refinements of, of the PDF from the 40 nanometer particles. So we have the, the experimental PDF and the calculated here in red. And if we compare this, well, we can identify what goes wrong in the model. Because since we know the structure here, um, we can sort of index all of the PDF peaks and say what exactly they come from. And if we look at these peaks here, this first one would be a molybdenum oxygen peak. Here we have uh, edge sharing molybdenum molybdenum and a second edge sharing molybdenum molybdenum distance um, because we have this distorted Wu-Tile uh, model uh, that we're using. This would then be the corner sharing peak here at 3.75. And what we see is that there's something wrong with how these are described. So there's something wrong with how much of edge sharing versus corner sharing that we have. And we can see that this is a size effect. So as we um, decrease the particle size, as we go to the a more amine in, this, in the solvent, but we have an increase in the intensity of the uh, peak that arises from its sharing of the hydra in the molybdenum oxide structure. Um, and that can help us sort of understand the, the structural defects that are present in this. So what we tried to do first is to think about, can we make a simple model that would then describe these uh, extra edge sharing or tahedra that we appear to have in our nanoparticles? And these are again the 40 nanometer nanoparticles, or what we call crystalline nanoparticles, um, where we saw in the PDF fit here before that we had some issues in the local range. So what we tried to do is to sort of include some, some more edge sharing in this structure. And we do this in this very simple way where we simply introduce an extra phase uh, compared to this rutile phase, which is a hollandite structure, which is related to rutile sort of defect chemistry. And what we do is that we just uh, use a spherical dampening. So we describe this as a very, very small particle so that we basically just add edge sharing octahedra or more edge sharing octahedra to this. And this means that we can fit this fairly well. We, um, we can now fit this edge sharing and the corner sharing ratio because we have more freedom in our model. This isn't to think that we then have small nanoparticles of uh, hollandite in our sample, but that we have uh, point defects where we ha have extra edge sharing octahedra. So this can sort of explain a little bit the structures, but we can try and do the same for the smallest nanoparticles, these what we call nanostructured nanoparticles. And what we see here is that, well, we, that won't really help to include this hollandite structure in our model, because here we change not only the local structure, but also the medium range structure, so the full atomic arrangement in the structures. So we have to think further how to analyze the defects in this. And we can think a little bit about bulk molybdenum oxide chemistry. So I mentioned before that we have these um, um, Magnelli series, so Magnelli structures, where we form shear planes uh, in a structure uh, of, the, of, the, of the bulk starting structure. And molybdenum oxide can form this rhenium oxide, uh, a simple corner sharing structure here. And when you then form a Magnelli series of these, what you do is that you shear, so you make a shear plane in the rhenium oxide structure and get these ordered uh, defects here. And this is sort of what we're looking for because we're looking for more edge sharing compared to corner sharing. But the problem here is that this is an rhenium oxide structure when it comes to molybdenum oxide. And what we're looking for is something that is closer to a rutile structure. But we know a lot of other rutile structures um, we know, for example, titanium oxide and brutal structures in titanium oxide will also form shear planes. Um, so we can sort of start thinking about how can we use a molybdenum oxide rutile or a rutile and make shear planes and then get a fit um, of our data. And if we think about what happens when we shear, basically what we're doing is that we're moving part of a rutile lattice. So here I've just a sort of a very sort of a simple sketch of a rutile structure. So these would be metal ions. And what happens when we shear is that we move part of the 
part of the lattice. So what we can try to do is then to, to in, include these as defects in our model. So in a very simple way, we can take our starting route our model, and then we can add uh, an extra site, which corresponds to really just sharing uh, a route our lattice. And we can do that here. And this immediately gives us a much better fit. So it seems like we have this kind of double root tile lattice um, that appears as defects in the small nanoparticles. We can go further and we can make a full model where we have different domains of, um, of, of these shear planes or shared root tile lattices or double root tile lattices. And then we actually get a fairly nice fit and describe the features even of the smallest of the nanoparticles. So what we're learning from this is that we can use the defect chemistry that we know from bulk materials to, to start describing the atomic structure in small nanomaterials. And we're using here very simple models. And this is probably not the way to think about it in real life, that we have a very ordered structure. We would rather have different areas um, of the structure where we have this shearing. And we can see that actually with, uh, with some nice TEM where we, where we look at, uh, this is one of the small particles uh, that, that we saw before of about four nanometers. And here we, we, we have atomic resolution, so we can try sort of like overlay it with a root tile lattice. So this would be a root tile lattice that we overlay here. And what we see is that we actually do have this as, as we expect from the PDF modeling, this extra intensity coming from these defects um, in, uh, in the root tile lattice, as, as we saw before with this very simple model. So basically what we saw for the molybdenum amoxide is that we can, uh, we can use the defect chemistry that we know from bulk materials that will help us describe um, the, uh, the structure of nanomaterials. The smaller the particles got, the more defects, and therefore we needed the, the defects would affect not only uh, the, 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 the local structure, but actually the whole medium range structure of the nanoparticles. And this is something that we're looking at in a, in a range of different materials where we, where we can see this common trend that if we understand defect chemistry in bulk materials, well, then we can start uh, describing a lot of other structures. Um, so we can use PDF to describe a, a material. And as chemists, another thing that we're really interested in is then understanding actually the chemistry that matters and how do these materials form and, uh, and why do defects form. So for this, we're using a lot of what we call in situ time resolved X-ray scattering uh, and in situ PDF. It's, it's, um, for a chemist, it's, uh, if, you, if you're an organic chemist, let's say, then, uh, then reaction mechanisms is something that you know fairly well. When I talk to my organic chemistry colleagues, well, they know when they plan a synthesis, they know fairly well what they want to do because they can predict, at least to a certain extent, what would happen with the, um, uh, sorry, with, with, with the electrons uh, in their reaction. This is not exactly how it works for, uh, for, um, sorry, for solid state materials where um, we have a much less understanding of the atomic scale reactions in as the material forms. So here, this is a sketch of, of the way we usually think about material formation, which is that atoms basically come together, form some sphere that then grows larger. Uh, we describe a lot of this with very classical nucleation theory, where we have these, uh, where we take into account sort of thermal, thermal dynamic interactions and, and can predict maybe if, if things will nucleate. But the atomic scale mechanisms is something that we, whether we, we don't really understand at this point. And, and this we, um, we need to change because this is another thing that sort of hinders us in becoming better chemists. Something that's been discussed a lot over the last years is this idea of materials by design, where uh, our theoretical chemistry friends can, can look at an atomic structure and they can then calculate what would be their properties. So we can predict what uh, structures we would like to have. But from an experimental chemist and a synthetic chem chemist point of view, this is a much harder problem to actually then predict how do I synthesize this structure? Because when we go to the lab, at least in my lab, there's a lot of trial and error uh, of trying to, to optimize the synthesis routes. 
So this is uh, something we would like to, to change so from trial and error to, to maybe have an idea of synthesis by design. And to do this, well, we need atomic insight into these nucleation processes. And in situ PDF can help us with this um, because the idea is in doing in situ total scattering compared to in situ powder diffraction, for example, is that we can follow the structural changes also before we have um, long range orders so or before we have anything crystalline. And I'll show a couple of examples of, of how uh, this can be used. So um, we're again talking about molybdenum oxides. Um, and I'll show how we can use total scattering and situ total scattering to follow how these materials can form. Because uh, it turns out that if you're doing sort of solution chemistry of molybdenum oxide and also tungsten oxides and niobium oxides, um, you will know these polyoxymetallates very well. So polyoxymetallates are these large clusters uh, or ions that can form in solution. And one of the things that we're trying to understand is how things get together. So we use polyoxymetallates as a little bit of a model system to understand uh, or to predict what kind of structures do we, would we might have as, as these pre-nucleation structures that can form during synthesis. Um, and so we're using this in this case to understand why these defects form in this molybdenum oxide system that I was talking about before. So the idea here is that we follow a hydrothermal or sulfur thermal synthesis as, uh, as it goes. So we have a little setup where we can synthesize nanoparticles um, uh, in the beam. So we can heat a capillary and we can pressurize a capillary and then we can follow the reaction as it goes. And in this case, we're studying the formation of what we again refer to as crystalline molybdenum oxide, so these larger nanoparticles, and then nanostructures structured um, molybdenum oxide, so the small nanoparticles that we were looking at before. So um, but as we collect in situ data, uh, in situ total scattering data, we can also, uh, we can get in situ PDFs and then follow what's going on. And we can see that we can, we see structures, or get structural information from before we have crystalline order. So these are, uh, this is just an overview of the data. So we did this experiment at at three different pH values, where at lower pH, we'll get the crystalline material, and at a larger pH or higher pH value, where we get um, these nanostructured materials. Here we see the data at pH 5, 3, and 1. And the first thing that we can just not notice is that it's much, much faster at a lower pH value. Uh, whereas as we get up to pH 5, where we form these nanostructured materials, the growth seems to happen slower. So then we can try and sort of correlate, can we, or make a correlation between what we see before and what we see in the end of the, of the, um, the synthesis. So these are PDFs from the precursor solution. So this is at room temperature and then a few seconds after we turn on the heating. So as we're getting towards the synthesis temperature of 260 degrees. And luckily, we, a lot of people have studied molybdenum oxides before and, and also these polyoxymetallate clusters. So we, we sort of know what to expect um, if we have uh, a spe specific pH value. And, and this here would be the, the species that we expect. And we can then try to sort of fit this to our data. And, and it, it works fairly well. Uh, here we have a pH 5, where we can predict that we have a, a fairly small cluster, whereas at, at larger pH, uh, higher pH values, oops, um, we get these larger structures that we form. When we start turning on the heating, as we'll see, then a lot of this order breaks down. But it's the same idea then that we can sort of take specific times uh, during the synthesis and then we can model the PDFs with known polyoxymetallate clusters as we have here. So here's pH 1, pH 3, pH 5, where we then take the known clusters and we fit them to the PDFs and we try to, to fingerprint which clusters are present at, at the different places or um, sort of steps during the synthesis. So here um, at pH 1, we, we learned that we, we go from a fairly large cluster to a smaller structure, um, but still an order molybdenum 6 uh, cluster, then actually forming a MO3 structure before we form the rutile structures we were expecting in the end. At pH 3, as we go up, well, we start from a slightly smaller cluster, but again, it appears that we go towards this MO6, although the data is, uh, is a little bit tricky to analyze here, and so don't uh, take it too seriously. But um, we go from MO6 to MO4, or at least something that is very disordered. And then uh, in the end, we go again to a rutile structure, but actually with quite a lot of these point defects that we saw before, also that we do have uh, too much edge sharing in the structure. <clears throat> 
at pH 5, we go from a, something that is a cluster of this size to something completely disordered. And MO6 doesn't really mean much. We just know that we have a polymer of some kind that, that doesn't appear to, to have very much order. But then we form these nanostructured materials. So we're starting to sort of at least have some idea of, of the relation between the pH and then the reaction mechanism and then the final product. So we're still working on really understanding this and collecting more data. But have, can we then make some hypotheses about what, what, what leads to defects? Is it that we need this MO3 structure to avoid the defects? Or that the defects form as the particles grow? And we know this is much um, slower at higher pH. So we can go in and understand the species that we have during our, our reaction. Um, and this is the kind of studies that we do quite a lot, and we're looking at a lot of both different oxides, but also metallic nanoparticles to really sort of get a fingerprint of, of the intermediate species or the pre-nucleation species from PDF, um, so with, that we basically can, can understand reaction mechanism and, and predict what happens during a synthesis. Um, as you might have sort of seen from now is that a lot of what, what we're doing is trying to find models. So. Uh, the biggest part of our job is basically to find a good model to try to fit. Because we always in PDF world will say we're super intuitive because we're in our space so we can just directly extract structural information. And that's to some extent true that if you know what you have, then it's easy to say that this peak will be from a specific atomic pair. But to really extract information, we need a model. And then the problem is often to find a starting model for refinement and, and analysis. And this is something that we're trying to work on now to get better at. So um, one of our ideas with this is that we can automate the process. So we want to not only have our in-situ total scattering, sometimes we also need to, to add different kinds of, uh, of data. We do quite a lot of small angle scattering as well. But the idea is, can we use all the chemistry that we know so very well from the last hundred years or hundreds of years? Um, for example, using these polyoxymethylates that are, that are well known, can we, can we use these as sort of a database mining and then just fit all of them and see what's going on? Or can we, can we come up with some automated ways of modeling them? And this is something that we're working on quite a lot and, and this is still work in progress. So, uh, so there's some loose thoughts coming up now. But one of the things, for example, that we're using this for is to again study the formation of materials. This is just a, a short example where a few years ago, we, uh, along with uh, the Iverson group at Aarhus University, we were studying the formation of this zinc tungstate material. Um, we're interested again in how these polyoxymethylase play a role in, in nucleation of materials. And when we did this study of zinc tungstate, we found that the precursor structure that formed could be described really, really well by this highly ordered structure of polyoxymethylate, which is, which is well known. So in my group, we were looking into then, well, can we understand these other structures also, the formation of iron tungstate, manganese tungstate, and, and, and pretty much add any, any other metal into it. And can we then relate this to the same formation mechanism? And when we collected the data for the precursor, and this is my student Susanna, or postdoc Susanna, who's, who's working on this, well, we saw that the PDFs of the precursor structure were not the same as for the zinc tungsten, and they're much less ordered. So there, we need to find a way of still extracting structural information. So basically what we would usually then do is to just try a bunch of different polyoxymethylates and fit this to the PDFs and then see what works best. But there's a lot of these, and there's also quite a lot of human bias and when you then want to sort of what structure might, might work. So what we're developing now is, is a way of optimizing and automatizing this, uh, this process where we don't just choose what we would like to fit, but, but pretty much try to fit uh, any structure that we can think of or that data beta database can think of. So for example, in, in this project, we are using the COD database and, and trying using different scripts to extract what might be sort of um, chemically relevant structures that are clusters and have some of the right metals or atoms in it, and then make the computer find out what might fit. And what we were learning from this sort of automating uh, this process was that none of the structures that we found from this database would really fit our PDFs. Some of them fit, fit better, but, but we didn't really see this sort of like, this is the solution and, and having this cluster. <clears throat> 
So what we then try to do is think about, can we still use the chemistry that is known from these clusters that we do identify and then extract some, well, understand which structural motives might actually be present um, because we probably don't come up with completely new chemistry as we're doing this. So a way that we're doing this is uh, what we right now call structure permutation or sort of an iterative change of the structures. Because what we found was that this, for this project, that this cluster here, the sandwich iron a polyoxymethylate, seems to at least fit some of the features in the PDF really well. But can we then sort of find out, okay, what the, the, what's important in the structure? Would that then um, be present in the structure? So can we change this structure, or remove atoms, or add atoms sometimes also, to find out what motives will be in, in, important here? So this here uh, has uh, 24 atoms um, or groups. So what we're basically trying to do is remove some of them at a time and see, does that improve the fit or does it um, decrease the quality of the fit? So what, what we're trying to do is then to see what clusters come out of this and what do they have in common? So we're basically looking at, I think I have a fit here, that, that will try all these different kinds of clusters and then see what works and what doesn't work. And from that, we can learn about what structural motives are important in this. So when we show structures like this, and this is still something we're, we're learning how we, can, uh, how we can analyze, it's not to say that this is a unique solution to the structure problem or that this is the structure of the cluster that we have, but it's a way to identify what is the important motives that would be in the structure at this point. So we need some statistical analysis of these results before we can really say too much about the structures, but it will, it will help us in understanding what's important. And therefore, we can do this to all of our data and then to do some reaction mechanisms. So this, this uh, data isn't published yet, but, but we show a little bit about the structure in this paper that came out uh, earlier this year in general of like crystallography. Um, now the question is, of course, we have lots of data, we do lots and lots of fits, can we use machine learning? And this is also something we're asking ourselves. So, so we're using, uh, looking into how machine learning can help us in both understanding the results that come out and also finding models. And, and we recently published this or put this on archive, uh, this paper about how we can use machine learning in, uh, in understanding all of these problems. So uh, hopefully that's something that we see much more of as I think we'll see in, in most sort of scattering analysis uh, in the coming years. So basically what I wanted to say is that PDF is wonderful and we can learn a lot about materials from PDF analysis. We think it's excellent for this sort of nucleation chemistry where we learn a lot uh, of new chemistry by following atomic distances um, because we can use it to understand both cluster chemistry, uh, the early stages of material formation and also the final materials. It's also important that PDF is not really enough um, we always need different data. Also, we do quite a lot of small angle scattering and combine that uh, with our data. And we're learning how to also combine with spectroscopies uh, to, to have this full picture. Uh, and then at this point in the sort of the history of PDF analysis, I think also a lot of people are looking into to new and, and uh, creative approaches to uh, how to analyze our data. And we're doing this to become better chemists so that we can follow this material discovery timeline for uh, for basically all the materials that we're looking for. And um, with that, I just wanna thank uh, my group uh, who's done all of this work. This is our face centered cubic uh, group photo. Uh, the funding agencies that have funded us, all of our collaborators, and of course the beamlines uh, that all of these data were collected at and, and all the good beamline support that we've seen. And uh, thank you all for your attention. <laughs>